Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church and Merry Christmas.
welcome to this worship service recorded for Sunday, November the 29th, the first Sunday in Advent. Today we are recording from my home to your home for various reasons, but also because it is Thanksgiving week and a way in which we can bless each other during this good time. I invite you now to join with me in our call to worship. If only the heavens would tear open and God would come down, the mountains would shake and tremble, all earth would stand in awe. Many have turned their backs on God, believing that they, under their own power, can right all wrongs. We too have failed miserably when we depend only on ourselves. Be with us, O Lord. Open our hearts and pour your love into our lives. Give us confidence in you, for you are always with us. And now I invite you to join with me in a prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. In Christ we are made new. We are healed and forgiven. We are challenged and guided to become those who work for the better rather than those who would destroy and damage. You call us your people, O God, and we are eternally grateful. Help us to pay attention to the many ways in which you enrich our lives. O Lord, it has become far too easy for us to focus on the negative. We seem trapped in its spidery strands. The coronavirus pandemic has us fearful and anxious. This morning, we celebrate the beginning of the season of Advent, the coming of the Holy One, the surprise of the birth of Jesus. But before we can begin the celebration, we have to acknowledge where we have fallen short. We need to change our attitudes of defiance to visions of cooperation. Be with our families, friends, and neighbors who suffer from illness, sorrow, alienation, marginalization, abuse, and fear. Please bring healing and peace to their lives and to their souls. Be with our families, our friends, and our neighbors who are experiencing great joy and happiness. May their spirits rejoice in all these good moments and in your great gifts. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen.
But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task and tells the other, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Advent is a time of preparation for Christmas. And those responsible for setting up the Christian lectionary find passages that emphasize waiting and readiness. Sometimes, like in this little apocalypse from Mark's Gospel, the watchfulness and waiting are extended to refer also to the second coming of Jesus Christ. On that day, there will be great joy and blessings for all who believe. Therefore, we are to wait expectantly. Indeed, readiness has as much to do with being ready for life today as it has to do with life's end. Advent is a time of waiting. All the imagery we read about Christ's coming, including signs in the heavens and signs on earth, are meant to be encouraging to Christians and not scary. We are already living in frightening times. So my sermon today is entitled Expect a Miracle. And it's a message about expecting good things, about being surprised by joy, to coin the phrase from C.S. Lewis's book. It's about waiting expectantly. It is about waiting with faith for something wonderful. It is about the miracle of surprise. So on that theme, let me begin with my first miracle of surprise story. And if you've heard it before, I apologize. But it is always a great uh, encouragement to me. Way back in 1985, when I was serving a church in Pretoria in an area known as Sunnyside. The church was called Sunnyside Methodist Church. It was a beautiful sanctuary had Tiffany stained glass windows, a great pipe organ. The parsonage was located next to the church, a grand old house amidst high-rise apartments and office blocks. It was about five minutes from the center of Pretoria, a very built-up area. This particular year we were in the midst of a drought in South Africa. And we had to use water sparingly. In our church garden and at the parsonage, we had roses. We had church lawns and bushes. And they were dry. A congregation member who was a medical doctor and owned his own pathology lab offered to finance boring for water at the church. And he would put in an irrigation system for us the pipes and the faucets all from the borehole. So 
He called in a water diviner who walked around the church and eventually stopped about six yards from the church building, right near the entrance to our basement chapel, and actually some feet below the end of the sanctuary building, where there were beautiful stained windows high in the wall, located above the altar. The divine, the diviner said to us, down here you have a confluence of two large underground streams of water. You should drill here. So taking his word, a huge rig was set up and we at the parsonage had ringside seats. They began drilling. They had only drilled about 60 feet when there was a huge rumbling noise and the explosion upward of stones and mud and water shooting many feet into the air, actually higher than the building itself and making me fear for damage to the stained windows. The well was capped and there was gallons and gallons of water oozing out continually from then on. All the way down the future we never lacked water. It was like streams in the desert, like blessings bursting from within. That miracle actually had a sequel because Dr. Dubasson, who donated the well, asked if I would conduct the wedding of a friend of his, not at Sunnyside, rather on his country estate, about five hours away. He wanted to be married as the sun set one Friday evening. He offered a helicopter ride, which I respectfully declined, and so Dale and I were driven up in a brand new Mercedes Benz. As we neared the end of our drive, the sun was going down. We drove over a hill and there it was, a beautiful Spanish style ranch set in a fenced ground because it was an animal reserve. We could see zebra and deer. When the watchman saw us coming over the hill, he began ringing the bell hung near the little chapel, which was set into the walls of the ranch. All the congregation were seated in front of the chapel, which only had enough space for the wedding officiant and the bride and groom. And so there we stood in the chapel, the congregation behind us, with a wonderful sunset and performed this wedding. I found later, and this is the point of the story, that that farm or ranch was called Surprise. Surprise story number two. Members of a previous congregation named Brian and Denny had been married seven years and had no children. They tried many kinds of fertility treatments. Eventually, Denny became pregnant through in vitro from her husband's sperm. There was great excitement all around, friends and family alike. Near the end of the pregnancy, there was a baby shower at the church. Everyone was ready for this little boy's welcome. Then tragedy, terrible, terrible tragedy. The boy was stillborn on a Sunday morning, perfect in every way, but stillborn. It was the most heartbreaking time. The funeral had us all in tears. We were broken hearted, the community and the family. But Brian and Denny never gave up. They had one final last resort. They still had three frozen embryos. They were all viable. And, praise God, triplets were born. Two boys and a girl healthy and well. The whole church gathered round. They brought in meals, they babysat, and they celebrated their first birthdays. 
it was a wonderful time. Great parents and great children, and I'm still in touch with them today as these children have grown up and become young men and women. That was surprise number two. Now surprise number three, it's also called the story of a sinner. Bear with me as I read you the story. A man wrote, after living what I felt was a decent life, my time on earth came to the end. The first thing I remember is sitting on a bench in the waiting room of what I thought to be a courthouse. The doors opened and I was instructed to come in and have a seat by the defense table. As I looked around, I saw the prosecutor. He was a villainous looking gent who snarled as he stared at me. He definitely was the most evil person I have ever seen. I sat down and looked at my left and there sat my attorney, a kind and gentle looking man whose appearance seemed so familiar to me, I felt I knew him. The corner door flew open and there appeared the judge in full flowing robes. He commanded an awesome presence as he moved across the room. I couldn't take my eyes off him. As he took his seat behind the bench, he said, let us begin. The prosecutor rose and said, my name is Satan, and I'm here to show you why this sinner belongs in hell. He proceeded to tell of lies that I had told, things that I had stolen, and in the past when I cheated others, Satan told of other horrible things that were once in my life, and the more he spoke, the further down in my seat I sank. I was so embarrassed that I couldn't look at anyone, even my own attorney, as the devil told of sins that even I had completely forgotten about. As upset as I was at Satan for telling all these things about me, I was equally upset at my attorney, who sat there silently, not offering any form of defense at all. I knew I had been guilty of these things, but if I had done some good in my life, couldn't that at least equal out part of the harm I'd done? This was a terrible surprise that I did not want right then. Satan finished with a fury and said, This sinner belongs in hell and is guilty of all that I have charged, and there is not a person who can prove otherwise. When it was his turn, my attorney first asked if he might approach the branch. The judge allowed this over the strong objections of Satan and beckoned him to come forward. As he got up and started walking, I was able to see him in his full splendor and majesty. I realized why he seemed so familiar. This was Jesus representing me, my Lord and my Savior. He stopped at the bench and softly said to the judge, Hi, Dad. And then he turned to address the court. Satan was correct in saying that this man had sinned. I won't deny any of these allegations, and yes, the wages of sin is death, and the sinner deserves to be punished. And then Jesus took a deep breath and turned to his father with outstretched arms and proclaimed, However, I died on the cross so that this person might have eternal life, and he has accepted me as his saviour, so he is mine. My Lord continued, His name is written in the book of life, and no one can snatch him from me. Satan still does not understand yet. This man is not to be given justice, but rather mercy. As Jesus sat down, he quietly paused, looked at his father and said, There is nothing else that needs to be done. I've done it all. The judge lifted his mighty hand and slammed the gavel down. The following words resounded from his lips. This man is free. The penalty for him has already been paid in full. Case dismissed. Oh, what a miracle of surprise. As my Lord embraced me and led me away, I could hear Satan ranting and raving, I won't give up, I will win the next one. I asked Jesus as he gave me my instructions where to go next. Have you ever lost a case? Christ lovingly smiled and said, Everyone who has come to me and asked me to represent them has received the same verdict as you. Paid in full. Believe. Have faith. 
and expect a miracle. So as I conclude, all history stands on the brink of a great reversal. When everything else is gone, Jesus' words will never pass away. Everlasting words. And this is Advent. It is a time of miracles and of surprise. And so I ask you, even in the midst of a pandemic, expect a miracle. Amen. Thank you.